<clears throat> okay, you're you're good to go. Thank you, John. Well, welcome everybody. Um, today I did a tally, uh, actually, on how many poets we've had uh, appear on Lip Balm. It turns out we've had. 573 poets and, and authors appear on Lip Balm so far since we got started. So if that's anything to go by, <laughs> um, uh, it's another number to be thrown out there. Anyway, um, today I'm delighted to welcome our poet friends from across the pond. Um, and many thanks to Vic Shirley for putting this together. Uh, and today we're featuring Vic Shirley Sasha Akhtar, uh, Nikki Melville, Ellen Dillon, and Matthew Hay. Um, but before we get to that, let me introduce my co-host, Jeffrey Cyphers Wright, who received his MFA after studying with Allen Ginsberg. Jeff uh, is uh, known as a new romantic poet, but he's also a publisher, critic, eco-activist, impresario, filmmaker, puppeteer, and artist. He's the author of, author of 19 books of verse, including Blue Liar and Party Everywhere. Uh, his poems have appeared in many uh, reviews, including New American Writing, The Brooklyn Rail, and Posit. Um, and his recent work also appears in the anthologies Best American Poetry, New York Insiders, and Contemporary Surrealist and Magical Realist Poetry. And by the way, if any of you guys are ever in New York City, look him up. Uh, I'm sure he can help uh, hook you up with a reading or something like that, right, Jeff? Yeah, man. If I can't, Rufus can. <laughs> it's a German institute or something. Also, uh, Jeff's uh, latest uh, book is Double Gangster, which is out from Mad Hat Press. Uh, and Jeff recently won the Sir Vision James Tate Prize, and he publishes Live Mag in New York City. Oh, thank you, Mark. What was that number of readers you said? How many? I was spacing out there. 473, I think I said. What a great number, huh? I didn't, write, I didn't write it. I should have written it down. No. Oh, thank you, son. Thank you. <laughs> Are you going to introduce me, Rufus? I've been introduced. No, I'm going to read the haiku that Mark asked me to write. Okay, Rufus, let's hear it. What is it about? I was sitting in the park. Just you be quiet now, okay? Ice woman rings bell. Mother and daughter laugh alike. I write with my tail. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rufus. That was nice. Okay, see you next time. Thank you, Rufus. You write with a tail is what you wrote there. So I'm going to read my new sonnet here. It has an epigraph by uh, Walt Whitman. I give the sign of democracy. Leaves of glass. You brought red cherries. We shared a muffin at Union Square till a shower drove us into a doorway. I saved some thunder for later. The sky is no poorer for all its endless gifts. Yo, somebody's the what is going on? Wait, I'm not done. Hold on. I know I just wanted to stop that little noise. If we could mute it. The, the noise, you heard it? You guys heard it? It was like a squirrel in the machine. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to start again. Okay, it's short. Leaves of glass. I give the sign of democracy. You brought red cherries. We shared a muffin at Union Square till a shower drove us into a doorway. I saved some thunder for later. The sky is no poorer for all its endless gifts. Hanging on to every word, let me call you sweetheart. Let me keep you company in the long shadows we've come to box up. A phoenix in every pot. My mind is a fire rummaging through the ashes of old adages, looking for good badinage to rally the masses. Time to take ukulele lessons, citizen activists. Time to make brass knuckles out of memes. More moet, my sun drop on a golden chain. 
I could live forever in what your glass leaves. So that's my patriotic poem. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Now, just as Marcus is delighted to have our guests, and I am too, I'm also deliriously happy to introduce Mark Vincent. Mark Vincent is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist, and musician. He's published over 40 books of poetry, translations, and fiction, including, more recently, the beautifully named Pearl Diver of Irimani, The King of Prussia is Drunk on Stars, The Mayfly Codex, Three Telltale Love Signs, Thieves Canto, and just released The Visitation, a novelette from Sir Vision. Forthcoming poetry collections are Spells for the Wicked from Unlikely Books, and No More Animal Poems from White Pine Press. Mark is also a prolific translator and has translated from the German, Romanian, and French. He's published 11 books of translations, most recently, An Audible Blue, Selected Poems, 1963 to 2016, by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz, which won the 2023 Massachusetts Book Prize for Translated Literature. Mark's own work has been translated into many languages, including Japanese, Chinese, Russian, French, Italian, Spanish, Romanian, Greek, German, and Icelandic. He's currently working on a novel entitled The Age of Occasions. And Mark's an editor and publisher of Mad Hat Press, thank you, Mark, and a publisher of New American Writing. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but now lives on a rural farm in Western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain, Melville's inspiration for Moby Dick. And around Mark, there also live even still more <laughs> cyanobacteria, assassin bugs, and golden rod stowaways than there are people bipedal hominids. Please welcome our host, the man with the most, Mr. Mark Vincent. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm going to read a poem in four parts, um, which is called Fragments of a City Called Oak in Linear B2. Uh, and this poem uh, is in a book called Ironclad, which is an archaeological discovery of a a heretofore unknown civilization. Fragments of a city called O in linear B2. C7330-7AE, scroll fragment in pottery urn, human remains, tiger woman image. Scattered evocations evoking meditations, the young ones scamper across rectangular passages of time. The older search for just the right square. The even older still hold onto their best square. Meanwhile, the ancients plan the next best square. Fragment C947-9H, broken a wax seal, three parts. An escape from the corporeal a facile lurch into the beyond, as if plunging through one's own reflections, as if descending into a long, narrow cave that carries you out into the other lighter end of the universe. Fragments C1039, 54E, wrapped around a human tibia. Dearest Marcelino, Sending you our heartfelt sour grapes. This wine you had delivered is rather empty. Still, may the will of the one live within you, both as human and spectre. I hate to be so practical, but I think you took me for a sucker on that last deal with the three lame dandelion ewes. They were cheap since they could barely totter, but still produced the most voluptuous ewes milk, creamy, frothy, the substance of clouds, you'd said. Actually, 
their milks squirted out rancid and stinking of ghastly demonic fringe elements. The rumbles could be heard all the way down to the fire temple. The aunties complained their cheesecakes were turning out lumpy and soggy. Many cities have subsisted in swampland, but this is ridiculous, they said. I cleverly explained it was all in the reptile eggs they were using and the elbow motion. Yours anxiously, anxiously, Mauritanio. Dearest Mauritanio, as you will know by now, I am not to be trusted. Still, I am not without my advantages. Actually, these were three of my favorite views. May I suggest that the milk in question be applied in the manufacturing of a soft, cured curdled cheese that pairs well with hard-boiled March rodents and black olives. I'm sure this will appeal to the elaborate tastes of your own infamous city of Eu. Please accept this gift of curds and whey as a token of mutual understanding. Blessings to your wife and barnyard fowl. May the will of the one and so on and so forth. Marcelino, dictated, but not proofread. And the last fragment, C4142-1B, a four-word inscription on the fossilized eye of a praying mantis. I of a beholder. Very good. Um, All right, super. And so now I am delighted to introduce my good friend Vic Shirley, who is a poet, writer, educator, critic, and editor from Bristol, now living in Edinburgh. Her collection, The Continued Closure of the Blue Door, uh, from HVTN, and her pamphlets, Corpses, Grotesquerie for the Apocalypse, and Poets, uh, and her book of photo poetry, Disrupted Blue and Other Poems on Polaroid from Hester Glock um, were all published in the, from 1922 to 22. Her most recent publications are Notes from the Underworld and Strangers Wave Joy Division Photo Poems, which both came out in 23. Vic has a PhD in dark humor and the surreal from the University of Birmingham. Welcome, Vic. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's lovely to be here and thanks to the Lip Balm uh, team for inviting me to curate a couple of shows. This is the first of two and I'm getting involved in the, um, we've got an absurdism, the absurdism special coming later on in October. And I'm especially uh, elated after meeting Rufus. So that's a, that's a, that's a really exciting one. Uh, this evening so far but yeah thanks to also to all the um, readers that have agreed that you're going to hear um, after I read my poems um, really um, love and respect these you know poets so much so I'm really um, really chuffed that they um, that they've agreed um, to do this and come and read with us so I'm just going to read um, go on 10 minutes I'm going to read some poems from my um Forthcoming, it would be, be my second full length collection, Nervous Tick, uh, which will be out with um, uh, Submarine Editions in spring. Um, so I'm going to read um, a little selection from, from there and I'm going to time myself to make sure that I don't go on because it's really annoying when um, people do that. So um, here we go. I'm going to start with the wet hollows. The forest is attempting to gain custody of me on the grounds that I have a leafy nose. No one has the energy to contest it, so there's a good chance it could all go through. I like belonging to the lake and am surprised and disappointed the lake is willing to entertain this prospect, let alone allow it to happen. The lake took me on due to my watery holes, and my watery holes have never failed. I've done exactly what is expected of me, therefore fulfilling any unsaid obligation. So I should like to understand why it is letting me go. I should like to take a look at all the legal records and all the related documentation. 
and I should like to know what to expect once the forest has custody of me and what will become my watery holes. Okay. I'm going to read a lipogram um, next. So for fans of the um, Ulipo, uh, a lipogram, um, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a poem without, um, without a certain letter. So uh, if anyone spots an A anywhere in this poem, you must let me know. Um, but there should, there should not be an A. Um, so it's a little game, really. So this is a lipogram in A. I fell in love with the sloth-like boy in the photo. Not everyone's thing I know, but to me, perfect. I forged sculpted exercise spells to conjure him, to usher him out of the picture, to deliver him to me. He didn't come. I tried dressing my dog up like him, but unwilling, my dog got upset. I'd done it before with boys in pictures. Dumbo octopus boy, I remembered. Mm. I eyed him, my dog, begging. He didn't soften. Tried to shut me out. I'd seen this before. Nothing to lose, I jogged his memory, reminding him of the boy who looked mole-like. The boy he'd worshipped, cherished, doted on, once present. My dog smiled coyly, curled his lip like Elvis, took position. What's next? Oh, OK, this is quite... So I'm going to read spells. So um, Mark's Press, Mad Hat um, Press put out a uh, anthology called... Um, Dreaming Awake, and it was prose poetry from the US, the UK, um, and Australia. And um, Spells was one that was selected by uh, Cassandra and Peter Johnson, the editors, Cassandra Atherton, um, who is also um, a co host, but maybe not here tonight. Um, so, this, um, my poem Spells, was in that um, uh, prose poem anthology, which I was very, very um, chuffed to, to be in. Spells. We came out from the bunker and there was nothing left. It was just dust and a milkmaid's. That was it. Oh, and tapestries. Plus a form from, for the Unemployment Bureau and a few pens, but only green pens. It wasn't much to start with, but we soldiered on. Eventually, we learned how to conjure food items and summoned ourselves some packet soup and fig rolls. I perfected a spell for sawdust so that if anyone learned how to conjure guinea pigs, we'd have something for their hutches, as long as someone learned how to conjure hutches. Starting from scratch was tough, but it gave me the opportunity to put my past and associated record behind me, and no one ever found out where my real skill set lay. Okay, I'm going to read prose poem, short fiction. It's one of those um, ones uh, I'm quite comfortable with, uh, that grey area in between. This was actually published in, in Tiny Monocule, Molecules, which is a US uh, short fiction um, magazine online. Um, and it's called, sorry, Beckett's going a bit berserk at the moment. Um, this one's called More Than a Feeling. The only thing that made her happy was listening to Boston's More Than a Feeling. It started ironically, as many of these things do, parties, air guitar, rock and roll, head, hand horns. Next thing you know, this woman's got a convertible, top down, driving down highways, looking earnest and wistful, saying things like, Jesus, I love this song under a breath, clenching her fists tightly, lost in the sheer power of the track. She's walking into bars, buying whiskies for guys, taking them back to her motel, making love to them, swishing her long blonde hair about with Boston's more than a feeling playing. By now, she can only climax while listening to the song. Then she starts collecting guys, training them to learn to sing it. She keeps them in the basement, feeding them only traditional foods of Boston, such as Boston baked beans, Boston chowder and Boston cream pie. Eventually, one of them escapes and blows the lid on her. Others weren't so lucky. She's sentenced to the electric chair, but is allowed to listen to her favourite song as they throw the switch. Lost in a Mansion, this one's another one um, that was in the Praise Poetry Anthology. 
lost in a mansion. Miranda began to cry. It had been years since she'd been lost in a mansion. It must have been at the 2010 Get Lost in a Mansion competition, which she had very nearly won. She had won the 2009 one, which was an incredible experience and why she'd started to cry at the 2010 event due to overwhelming memories. Unfortunately, this surge of emotion cost her the championship, someone with far less capacity than her for getting lost in a mansion won, which was a huge blow. So after much consideration and wishing to retain some degree of dignity, she retired. Yet here she was getting lost in a mansion again. This time, no one was here. There were, there were no cameras, no guests lost in a mansion, cheerleaders or crew. It was just her getting lost in a mansion, crying. In the ballroom, the ghost of her family, Shih Tzu, appeared, licked her face and whispered some words of encouragement, as it did when she was just a child, starting out in this whole getting lost in a mansion game. Some kind of training montage ensued, and she was finally able to get more lost than she'd ever got before. Okay, what have we got next? Okay, um, this poem, mine at all, um, is written after the poet Tom Jenks. This um, was uh, in an anthology called Obliterat. Um, I also um, edit Surreal Absurd. Um, if people, I'll put the link in the chat um, after I finished. Um, some of the poets here have, have been in Surreal Absurd. It's an ongoing series, worldwide series of poets um that who um who writes um uh, yeah surreal surreal and or absurd um work writing today um and yeah it is ongoing and um this was illiterate this was in a a, a um an anthology uh, with one of my co-editors who became uh, the co-editor later became a co-editor of surreal absurd um and tom jacks who, who this is written after has also got a surreal absurd very early on in the series so, um, yeah, I'll put that link for you for you to check out. It's real absurd. But anyway, this poem, mine at all. Golden due to falling around with a distant relative of King Midas, I still had my flexibility and was able to roam the plains. I spent time penning songs for the Minotaur, my most recent obsession. Not knowing much about him and it being merely a physical attraction, I decided to stay focused on the carnal, refusing to get bogged down in the complexities of mythology or amour in my lyrics. I mainly repeated words invented when, from a distance, I responded bodily to his head and tail for the first time. I also included lengthy descriptions of his horns, which I found so hypnotic, if I stared at them too long through my binoculars, I would go into a trance. I liked to recite the classics of Hall & Oates from memory, simultaneously beatboxing underneath. It was a rare gift, one I wasn't about to take for granted, and if that didn't win the Minotaur's affections, I wasn't sure what would. Let's have a look. Okay, nine minutes. I'm quite, I'm going to actually, I'm going to, I think I've just got, I've got right room for two. We're on nine, nine minutes. So I will read, read, read Gaspard. It's like a short fiction written after Lydia Davis. The more she thought about Gaspard, the more she dreamt about Gaspard. And the more she dreamt about Gaspard, the more her condition kicked in. Her condition had only started because of Gaspard in the first place. And she had no intentions of letting Gaspard know about this. Gaspar had his own condition to worry about anyway, and his wife, well, his wife had another condition again, which was sadly hereditary, so she didn't want to think about what kind of condition those children were going to end up with. It was hard to concentrate on any of this due to the picture of Gaspar looking down upon her. She needed to fix that, and it was probably time to write Gaspar out of her will. She had bur buried Gaspar's belongings in a time capsule in the backyard just days ago now, but still Gaspar's presence was in the house. She knelt down and said a prayer for Gaspar and for Gaspar's children, but she couldn't bring herself to say a prayer for Gaspar's wife, as quite frankly, Gaspar's wife was a whore. Okay, well, I'm just going to finish on one last one now, which is my Sistina for Rock's Ghost. Um, and um, this was published recently. Rob McLennan published this recently, and I'm just going to get straight on with this now because it's, it's, it's coming up to time. Sestina for Rock's Ghost. Mabel didn't have the energy to land the plane, so she kept flying, or cruising rather, while passengers looked at each other with bemusement and slight annoyance at her playing such terrible music over the tannoy. 
as almost none of them liked the genre of soft rock and literally none of them wanted to be John Bon Jovi. However, unbeknownst to those on board, until this fateful day, John Bon Jovi did want to be one of them. Probably the person you'd least expect on the plane. I mean, if you were looking at them all with a Columbo eye, Rock Hudson would be the last choice, not just because he's dead, but as there were other passengers who wore permed manes like 80s John Bon, liked the sound of their own voice over the tannoy, donned tight leather trousers and had a tasseled jacket flicking about to everyone's annoyance. But it was Rock Hudson that John Bon Jovi wanted to be. The annoyance and confusion, confusion when truth came out was widespread. What surprising taste John Bon Jovi harboured and how had Rock Hudson come back from the dead, someone asked over the tannoy. Then it became apparent that it was, of course, the ghost of Rock Hudson on the plane, not Rock, Rock Hudson himself. John Bon had met the ghost along with another of the passengers at a little soiree in New Jersey where celebrities and ghosts of celebrities go to rock. John Bon had never met anyone like him. Boy, that ghost knew how to rock. John Bon prided himself on his drinking, but Rock's ghost was better to his annoyance. And wow, his dancing had all the girls and girl ghosts dancing to Iggy Pops, the passenger. The soft rock god had never seen such a thing. Hey girls, he said, my name is John Bon Jovi. The girls didn't care. By then, Rock's ghost was telling an anecdote about flying a plane. They were laughing, gazing at him when call for Mr. Hudson's ghost came over the tannoy. But back to the here and now. How did anyone find out about this years later over the plane tannoy? For nearly a decade, John Bon had been disguising himself and following the ghost of rock. But remember, someone else that night witnessed the anecdote about the plane. Someone else who followed John Bon as he tailed rock to take that call. Annoyance wasn't the word for it. Red then blue with more than a splash of green, John Bon Jovi turned as he listened to the conversation. Rock called the girl on the phone, Passengers. This was the name John Bon's girlfriend liked to be called. No one else was called passengers. It was too unusual. The ghost of Rox Hudson had won his girlfriend's affections from the tannoy on the plane, shot through the heart and you're to blame. The song by John Bon Jovi made the ghost of Rock Hudson startle. You give love a bad name. This soft rock classic was no coincidence, he thought, and turned on seeing John Bon, the annoyance was subsumed by fear. John had a gun and shot Rock's ghost, forgetting he was a ghost on a plane. The aircraft went down. The passengers were killed as they hit the rocks. John Bond sang Living on a Prayer the whole time on the tannoy to everyone's annoyance. The ghost of John Bon Jovi emerged in time to see Rock's ghost flying away in his private plane. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. And thanks once again for putting this crew together. Um, next we hear from uh, Sasha Akhtar who is a creative writing lecturer at the University of Greenwich. Um, Sasha performs internationally. Some highlights include the Medway Festival of Literature, Emirates Festival of Literature, and Rotterdam Poetry Festival. Um, her most recent writings appear in Shudder Free Verse, uh, Delusine, Revista Journal, Prototype Annual, Cut Purse, and many more. Um, her new books are um, E Void Songs, Future Past, Sequence of, from Intergraphia Press, and a book of translations from Urdu with Oxford University Press. Um, Sasha has received an honorable mention for the 2024 AK Raoul Jaman Prize for book translations from Southeast South Asian languages into English, awarded by the Association for Asian Studies. Her poetry collections include The Grimoire of Gramalkin from Salt, The Whimsy of Dank Juju from Emma, and the innovative tarot deck of poetry, Only Dying Sparkles from Zimzala. Um, Sasha has been facilitating teachings in magical practice and poetry and the poetry school in London exclusively since 2018. Uh, she is one of the most exciting and daring poets working in the UK today. Believe me, here's Sasha. Hi. <laughs> These introductions are always like a, you know, like that moment that before death where they say there's a flash and you see your whole life. <laughs> oh, well, it's really nice to be here. And thank you, Vic, um, for getting us locked together. We're all we all supposed to have meant to have met quite a while ago, but this is this is the the first meeting for now. <laughs> um 
Okay. It's interesting because some of the poems I'd planned are sort of, yeah, so continuing on with this sort of theme of ghosts of celebrities or whatever, and also like milk, weirdly. Um, so this one is called uh, Triomphi, as in the Petrarchan sort of uh, Triomphi, the parade of... Uh, Join the fray. There are genuine articles to see here. Scurry on the board of moving pictures. Lotus, beetle, the after. On the walk, you cross a crack. We are the progeny of Rudolf Valentino smoking renegade cigarettes with the blues. Simic says, mother of God, everyone is invited. So I say, mother of God, everyone is invited. I am invited. Crack in the concrete footpath, bloodline of Theder Barra. I am in Munich with Herzog, marching on Paris. Children with solar discs instead of heads rummage through the waste paper of Camus. If you put an ear to the ground, you will have no sense of time. You will hear nothing. Feet tapping DJ shadow. The shoes of Bernard Shaw sitting in a Vietnamese restaurant named Pho. There are no respirators here, no crystal cages, no boxes with heads, no Domingo, no Luigi, no albatross, some albatross. A billboard engorged the face of Theda Barra, human specks crawling, trying to touch the black of her eye. My fingers are smudged with Theda Barra's eyes. I am in the artery of Camus. I am searching for Al Hazred. The lake has no water, hordes of boats unable to move. I am in the beard of Dickens. Could you do the hokey pokey? Beckett is sewing buttons on his shirt that has buttons. Simone de Beauvoir is not dead. El Greco is rolling dough out with his body in Somerset. We are trying to pave the road. In winter, afternoon could be evening. I hold candles. I am candles burning for antiquity. Neil Stevenson is snorting horse tranquilizer off the belly of Tolkien. That's that one. Okay, and oh, I full screened this, so I can't reach the rest. Okay, so uh, my, uh, my debut collection, The Grimoire of Grimalkin, is is having a is having a rebirth so there's going to be a second edition um and some of those poems are actually in the surreal absurd sampler that vic uh, so kindly published so i'm going to read some of those um and yeah you'll you hear the milk resonance um tribunal fortune arrives wedded by the bell I cannot calm her down. She screams of an abscess in her gums. I tell her to sit on the bench and drink some tea. My friend has engaged the rain to play at his funeral. He says not to worry, the band will be along shortly. In the basket are June bugs waiting to pounce on picnickers, hungry for egg salad sandwiches and pickled herring. A congress of dervishes is gathering under the silver birches whilst bankers die of botulism in the park. Overhead in the elm tree, one scarlet 
tanager starts to sing, announcing a Chopin race. The wizened organ grinder lurches a scherzo, tap dancing on the green, bearing his gums in a smile, leaking at the sky. A plastic hand reaches out of the perambulator and looks at me, askance. I have no milk, so I ask the vegetarian cineast next to me, does he have any? Mother runs over with a bag of durians and a chocolate cigar, gives us a dirty look and pops out her breast, veined like Stilton, and I wonder, perhaps breasts, do become cheese after a time. <laughs> um, so I wasn't timing it, Vic. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't ask you. I know you're not timing it. I will, I will, uh, I'll do, I, I've got the time. Yeah. Okay. You've done a couple of years. So I was just posting your surreal absurd in the chat. <laughs> I was doing it, but um, but yeah, you've got. I mean, you've you've done a couple of you. You've got you've got plenty of yeah. time. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Urban sojourn, part one. She calls severance. Fatal altruism won't help now. Bedded a black wager, one wined and dined till the cows come home. Let them fall where they may, the cows, like cursed hair off a fallow baroness. My restraint comes like a constipate trying to pass a bowel movement. We, we, je tonde, why do you bellow? Why do you blush so? In the woods, hunters sit and long for the mark to make them men. Smooth the smell of gunpowder, sweeter than you who puts the dog out, yanks him back in when it becomes fun. Cruel actor committing this felony with an amiable smile, patting his head, good boy, good boy, good milk turns sour in your wake. A single fluke worm assiduously burrowing sticks his head out, an unwitting mouth bites it in half. Neither one knows what happens next. Part two. I saw a portal into the future on the cobblestones, exchange saliva, brain dipped in ink stamps over, over and over your name. With cigarette fingers roam these dark streets dressed in case I meet El Diablo. Look up everywhere. There are crows perched on the fingertips of trees, solemn conference realm of senses that lies where, who knows? Vermouth in a tall glass, white sheet, taut, clutched overhead, crave the dawn, crystals crack in nose, liver laments at the tenacity of the unexpected to have its way, whilst in feather boas I dance. The ice. You running away from home? Want to put your shoes under my bed? Your coat in my closet? And I think, why the fuck not? Why the fuck not? <laughs> so that quote is direct from a guy on the street in, in New, York, New York City. <laughs> you running away from home? <laughs> that was... It was funny, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll do like uh one more of these sort of um yeah, they like someone called them jeweled monsters or something. Okay, that is the one I just read. Okay, so yeah, this is for my mate. Subfusk, after Bernadette Mayer. Nothing is sharp at 6 a.m. but the blinding sting of the sunrise in the irises. Jonathan Sadder, that's the epigraph. Doctor, the morphine hurts me. Daughter, 
the morphemes must be divided into dulcets, packaged into tidy wads of embolalia, for the grimace comes to wait at the foot of my head a little while longer. Doctor, I am petrified of the maquette in the Almira. Dodger, desist, I am dizzy, desirous of perpetual langui. Wearing my wig of bluebells, I shake my musty arms at. I must eke out this facade of nervous nurses and Dalmatian wards grown feral in denominations of ten swollen tangos and seven tangerines insistent. Will Zum Leben decides to take me for a constitutional amongst the eaves of thought negative g-force makes me wretch. The ace of knaves is uncovered from amongst the shrubbery. A dubious pleasure, this anabolic frolic from the start. Hi-ho, these guys are end of mission. Following on all fours, tales of the unexpected, not to you, but to your incision. A few pennies, chinkling change left over in case the Elan returns. Ergo, I cannot complain. Drambui, I must confess, on the brink of penury to indulge in. Nothing short of fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. That Thank you, Sasha. And uh, next, we're delighted to hear from Nikki Melville, who is a poet, creative writing teacher, musician, and occasional artist. For over 20 years, he's been developing a range of peripheral and small press publications in a variety of forms and genres, including found poetry and erasures, visual poetry, lyric experiment, conceptual and post-conceptual writing, and a badge. Uh, Nikki's work takes aim at and interrogates the imperatives of capitalism, politics, and ideology. He works as a lecturer and teaching fellow at the universities of Glasgow and Edinburgh, respectively. And Nikki's last book, The Imperative Commands, was published by Dostoevsky Wannabe in 2022, and his selected poems, Decade of Kats, is published by Blue Diode. Welcome, Nikki. Thanks, Mark, and thanks Vic, for inviting me. Uh, so I'm going to start off quite serious and uh, graduate to the absurd by then. Uh, poem for children in reaction to the killing of Hind Rajab. The hind fled the forest with her herd had been living among its trees and raised clearings ever since she was born. But now the whole wood world was aflame and her six-year-old hind legs had to run faster than ever to outpace the corn flag ration at the edge of a raised clearing. All ruined walls, they were stuck by a wolf but not one land warrior, armoured vehicle of rich hunters. Two, shooting socks. You can never have too many. Shoes leave a footprint. Boots leave a legacy. Slapping oak priests in their pasams, sounding oak wood roll calls to lure the herd. Three, no idea had I. Deer hunting is all sleight of hand, an unfair fight of coaxing and hoaxing. Salt block, munchies, digital, digital game, collar, fox jack, five, infernal wild, fire and spitfire, decoy, molasses. And while waiting, sharpened their ember leaf, garden, damascus knives. Four, a knife for life, runs a manufacturer's copy. Knives for lives, in the plural, perhaps, whose teeth left the herd for dead, except the hind whose call was heard by others in the wood, but the wolf killed the others who went to help. Gunslip is great, soft, and with a god lining. I type God instead of good. For God, read good. Not a gunslip, but a Freudian. God is not good. God is not great. While the hind continued crying out to the others who first heard her cries in the wood, who alone could hear her quietly crying quiet, more and more, for some time, till she died. Only then would the whole wood know by when it was too late, of course. 
Whichever way you parse it, it's literally the killing of a tribe, an anagrammatic sonnet. E, nice god. C, I do jean. I cog Eden. I O C D jean. Ice N go. Go N seed. Coin edge. Edge icon. Icon edge. G I D con. Gone iced. Dice gone. Seed no G I. Go and ice. This is also a system um, which was commended in the Troubadour uh, International Poetry Prize just recently, which is nice. Sharing a Coke with you. I gave myself an hour to write a sestina with the starting end word, William Carlos Williams, basically finishing it off for Kenneth Coke, who set the line, den line endings but couldn't even dream of how to finish it in days and nights. Perhaps too sleepy after nights with Marina. More likely he was stumped by the other end word hog snout. Obviously playing for laughs, as is was his want. A joke kicked into the long grass. An hour is now a year, and what a year. I've only just caught my breath. A year of love, of my life and death, finding out what an agonal breath is while hearing them. I wish the doctor there in the wards had been William Carlos Williams. He would have known so much depends on IV fluids and the tufts of grass in the co concrete courtyard outside the ward window, the scene a dream, something other to look at rather than my dying mother and the hog snout sounds of her body's automatic fluxes, 48 hours awake, never sleeping. But I started this as a love poem on Easter Monday 2022, excited by the challenge at sleepy, to write it in an hour and send two and four you to read on the train once you take a breath. For 35 minutes then and now, I thought of ideas for ending on Hogsnout. And it's end words, even the right term, when there's more than one. See also William Carlos Williams. How foolish to think I could write it in an hour. A typical evanescent dream of mine, the heady mists of over and no confidence in the always greener grass. My side, the building management factor, who do fuck all, are here now cutting the grass. So it's maybe just as well that writing this poem kept me from feeling sleepy, or the lawnmowers would have done the job, trimming the sod cestina dream. The difficulty of the form and Coke's end words put me off for months till trauma dropped my breath. That's the problem with Coke. Much as I like his variations on a theme by Carlos Williams, I'm no fan of the last clause. He's playing too much for laughs, like he does here with Hogsnout. Come to think of it, what I said in line 16 also counts for the end word Hogsnout. A move akin to ending a line not with grass, but with crab grass. And is it cheating if instead of WCW, I end with a line from my friend Rian Williams, author of the Poetry Toolkit, whose book I used to check the Sistina rules when sleepy with its difficulty. Coke, probably despite his use of verbosity, verbosity, didn't want to waste words or breath, and I can't imagine he ever even tried to write this, Estina. No doubt just a joke or a dream that some poet from the future would take the baton, the Sestina, and posthumous breaths away through a love poem elegy combo and one sleepy New York school homage, leaning, loafing and snuffling through grass in search of seven porcine variations. Pigs would be easy, but hogs... Now it comes to mind, no truffle nor trifle to see here, no vision nor dream to clear the mud before an envoy with modernism's envoy, William Carlos Williams. Did my mum's death dream, muttering her brother, the baby and the baby, include the green, green grass of home, the version in Tom Jones' hog snout, to evoke the wails of her mother's birth, all sleepy mining valleys, to close this poem of love and breath? with the deep ends of William Carlos Williams. Uh, I'm going to read the one that's in the current issue of Fence. Uh, it's called Killer Robins in the Snow. Killer Robins in the Snow, footnote one. Fun Robin fact. Ghost Riders in the Sky. A Cowboy Legend, the 1948 song by Stan Jones, later covered by Johnny Cash, was originally called Killer Robins in the Snow. Musicologists are divided as to whether the apostrophe is correct or rogue, 
leaving two contested interpretations. One, that a person called Killer Robin was in the snow, or two, Killer Robins are in the snow. This ambiguity is the reason why I chose this title for my poem. The iron ironical and mechanical robins with which David Lynch closes Blue Velvet are evidently a comment on these theories. A robin is standing on some snow. Robins almost always stand on snow. The default position is standing on snow. On Christmas cards in particular, which goes some way to explaining why the robin was voted the UK's fave feathered friend. But what the bird voting UK public don't know about robins, too, Another unfortunate example of the British public voting for something without the full facts is Robin's darker side. Not many do. It's too dark. Three. The shadow of the breast on the snow looks like blood. Take a closer look. It is blood. That Robin has killed again. It is a killer Robin. 10% of all adult male Robin deaths and 3% of female deaths are caused by other Robins attacking them. Typically, they peck at a rival's neck in an attempt to sever the spinal cord. One look at the statistics above is enough to show that 10 and 3% of these attempts are not attempts at all, but successful avicide. Way too dark to go into in a love poem like this one. Four, the mythical ideology behind the Robin's beloved red breast and how it came to be, evolving over millions of years since the first Robin hopped from prehistoric fern to prehistoric fern is another dark matter entirely, but can be guessed at by some of the suggestions about the blood above. Anyway, that Robin is standing on snow is on a tile, which is a coaster for putting zigs on. When considered more closely, it is not snow, but little white leaves which fade into a lavender hue, the tile's background. So the Robin is pretty much floating in a pale blue space. It is a killer robin floating in space. Sometimes you put a glass of water on the robin. Sometimes you don't. It doesn't really matter. What matters is you are there. Put your glass of water on the tile or not. All right, I've got one piece to finish with. Uh, it's a chat GPT story. Over the last year or two, I've started to make uh, weird daft chat GPT stories for readings involving the readers in the event and so on. And I've kind of tweaked them until I come up with a, a story that, that works that I quite like. Um, so this is like the third uh, iteration or fourth iteration of this partic these particular prompts. So I apologise to, to Jeff Wright because I didn't know he was co-host or I would, I would have put tonight or I would have put him in it as well. Lit Bam Lament, a surreal soiree of poets and Bam. In the fantastical realm of, realm of cyberspace, the grand event known as Lip Bam was about to unfold. Hosted by the ever-eclectic Mark Vincent and the enchanting Cassandra Atherton, the event promised to be a soiree of poetic chaos in Lip Bam lore. Poets from across the transatlantic and trans-Pacific realms were ready to join, each armed with their own brand of Bam and Shoes brilliance. Matt Hay appeared first, his background a swirling galaxy of lip balm tubes. Lip balm is my muse, he proclaimed, holding up a stick of blistex like a sacred relic. This is the saviour of dry lips and existential crises alike. As he read his poem, Ode to Blistex, his face gleamed with a glossy finish, reflecting the balm's shiny magic. It's lip balm, not lip balm, Mark reminded, rolling his eyes. Suddenly, Vic Shirley burst onto the screen, visibly fuming. Who spelled my name with a C instead of a K on the poster, she demanded. Her whippet, named Beckett, after the writer, nosing into the frame. Looks like Beckett's waiting for Doggy, she quipped, tossing a stone-like chew toy for the pup to suck on. She brandished a tub of Vaseline, her verses weaving an absurd tale of a desert where only Vaseline could protect one's sanity and skin. Ellen Dillon drifted in next like a spectral apparition, her face ethereal and slightly blurred, as if seen through a veil of mist. I prefer the pure simplicity of unbranded lip balm, she murmured, holding up a plain white tube. Her verses, abstract meditations on the fleeting nature of moisture, left the audience in a dreamlike daze, 
Remember, it's lit, not lip balm, Mark corrected again, though his words seemed to dissolve into Ellen's ethereal aura. Sasha Actor erupted onto the scene riding a digital whale, splashing virtual sea spray. Lip balm is the sailor's true friend, she declared, brandishing a tin of Carmex. Her poem, Carmex Currents, detailed a mariner's adventures where each application of balm was a ritual against the harsh, chapping winds of the sea. Her performance was a tempest of energy and animated expressions, leaving viewers awash in her poetic storm. Nikki Melville's entrance was heralded by the clatter of keyboards. Lip balm as currency in a dystopian future, he began, waving a stick of chapstick like a revolutionary banner. Only a bam would resist the revolution, Mark interjected, using the Scottish slang for a nutcase. Beckett the Whippet barked in agreement, adding to the delightful chaos. Nicky's poem, Chapstick Chronicles, envisaged a world where lip balm was the only thing keeping society from falling apart, each stick worth its weight in gold. Throughout the reading, Mark Vincent and Cassandra Atherton, stroke Jeffrey Wright, valiantly tried to maintain order it's lip balm, not lip balm, Mark corrected, corrected repeatedly, his voice growing more exasperated with each reminder. Just Jeff Wright, meanwhile, tried to keep Beckett the Whippet from overshadowing the poets. Looks like Beckett's not just waiting for Doggy, but stealing the show, she laughed. He laughed as the dog pranced across the screen, occasionally pausing to lick its lips in a pantomime of lip balm appreciation. Vic... Still fuming over the misspelled name, shouted, Maybe it was meant to be lip, Mark, and you just spelled it wrong. Mark shot back, Vic, you're being a bam. It's lip, not lip, bam. Their banter added a layer of delightful absurdity to the proceedings. As the event drew to a close, Mark and Jeff announced a special surprise. Each port would receive a year's supply of their preferred lip balm, courtesy of Lip Balm's quirky sponsors. The poets bade their farewells, screens flickering out one by one, leaving a trail of surreal images and absurd memories behind. Lip Balm had once again proven that in the world of poetry, anything was possible, especially when Lip Balm was involved. And as Mark's final words echoed, echoed through the digital ether, it's lit, not Lip Balm, the poets knew they'd created something truly forgettable. What a lot of lip. Very excellent. A lot of lids and a lot of lip. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Next, we hear from Ellen Dillon, who is a poet and teacher from Limerick, Ireland. Uh, her latest books are Fare Thee Well, Miss Caruso from HVTN and Tentatives from Panama Press. Uh, previous books look at Irish history from the perspective of butter, butter intervention and the teaching life of Stéphane Mallarmé uh, from Sublunary Editions in 21, and Stephen Malkmus Guitar, Solace to Malkmus from Sand Press. Ellen is currently working on a novel in prose poems called A Whale Called Milieu. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for asking Vic and Nikki. That's so hard to follow. Um, and I'm going to try to be not, not ethereal if I can possibly manage it. Although there are a, there are some ghosts in here um, and a respirator. No milk though. So um, I'm going to read a couple of sections, the opening sections from my most recent book, Fairly Well, Miss Carousel which is um, a story about, well, well, it's a story featuring the ghost of Towns Van Zandt and a respirator. Uh, okay. Can you hear me okay? I'm croaky and my- Absolutely, connection isn't absolutely good. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so legendary XL2, compensate for loss. We must compensate for loss of airway warming, they say. Protect the airway, but I'm not here to damage it or blemish any other way. As dead space fills with this free grace, my patient one, you know, I have been set to check your own expiratory efforts, overriding them for your own good for now. You know this breath is love, or will do once you're surfaced. Protecting you for life's best moments. This is the covenant given unto us. Every second I sink oxygen into you under pressure 
and resurface CO2. See me as an air miner of the alveoli. Hear the velar click that links living and not. I will never stop breathing for you now. And here in this O2 tensile minor moment, it is always now. Two shots ring out in the still of the desert evening. Pancho's knees crumple and he tumbles in slow motion. A puff of sand dust rises up around where he hits the ground soundlessly. Lefty drops his gun, runs to cradle a dying man's head, too late to catch any last words he might have whispered. Night falls as fast as the dead man. Soon it will be cold and time to go. Escape made possible through some acts of complicated overlooking. Time to go. Whatever can't be carried will be left here for the buzzards or whoever is passing. This scene plays out in my head every time the woman plays this song, and she plays it often. Out of kindness, knowing it's one I love. I spent whole days inside the gaps in its story, filling them in one by one. You never really get away with anything, it tells me. You drag all your choices behind you till you can't keep on walking. When you in turn fall, they hover around you like ghosts on the edge of your vision. In the night, I hear them murmuring above the clicking of the machine that keeps me breathing. Town Song One. Haunting is a second life, and when I followed you upstairs from the lobby of a shutdown hotel in North Tipperary, I knew without words that I was taking up a walk on part in the second act of your American afterlife. There was no more I after that, just us, and we used up all the other vowels, howling into the void, and the void howled back. The room filled up with an all right independent light and a star chandelier or neon ceiling constellation winked at us in our crippling fear of the dark. Headlights of angels blink on and off. This hotel is dreaming itself back up from blueprints in the basement. When they arrived in a cavalcade, dazzling wings made angel shaped scotomata to cookie cut the centre of our point of view. Scoot over closer, closer, my hollow boned ghost friend. Tell me what's left on the edge of your vision. Mine has oak leaf shadow, glitter tipped feather, and the margin of your face glanced sideways in error. Horror vacui fills every square centimetre of surface up with curlicues, and your first songs are orchestrated to within an inch of their natural lives. Shine up from one that pizzicato layering, my love, and sink your stylus deep in my windpipe. For without your plastic shafting, no breath is possible. Headlights of angels blink on and off. This hotel is dreaming itself back up from blueprints in the basement. Nothing, come of nothing, left for nowhere, led us down glad-handed and legless to a quiet glade where even the river was in no rush and the water bubbled too softly to muffle our cries. Nobody knew us there, nobody saw us to know us, and our footprints traced a tangled track to the water's edge, but not back. That was the first night. We sat it out, out walking the stalking and the screams. I spent so many hours staring at the cover of the 1969 Towns Van Zandt album, especially after I'd left the record player behind in a midnight flight from a failed house share and could only look at it and mutter the songs to myself. The ukulele was gone too by then, so I couldn't play along. I'd picture Towns getting up to stretch tired from his downcast pose at the artfully distressed occasional table and trying each of the colanders on his head before settling on the blue one, worn at a slant like his cowboy hat in heart-worn highways. Town song too. You always said the dreams had escaped into your life and now no spirit known to man could corral them. You tried out riding, too tired to dismount and face them if they had a face but there's no out running when you walk in circles. You paced a landscape full of ghosts, filled with ghosts who'd made of you a hollow host. Hold me close, she cried, something I just can't get over. Curled on a mattress on the floor, the wind whistles through your bird-boned ribcage and I could not love you more. I'm stepping out of us for just one moment to make it clear that this pile of floor skeleton and rag rubble was once two separate bodies before iron skin melted, the ribs clicked and melded, and I linked into you and sank into our inclined dream. All the good and bad make of us something that no one else has, you and I. Ampersands, anding us together like handcuffs. 
Thank you. And uh, the last thing I'm going to read is uh, two sections from, three short sections from what I hope will be my next book, um, A Whale Called Milieu. What can't be captured, feeling, sunlight, birds in flight, that one white whale. The capture model assigns virtue and value to what can be caught, pinned, quantified, thought through neatly to the end. Like teenage fan club, we hate for a similitude. It's not even all, like, all that like the real, just reveling in its own refusal to throw away the mold. Gorgeous morning light fills up the moss whose tiny red filaments reach out to milk it. They're milking light. Mere Quimby had been promised dog or higher, but what's higher than the light? This new milk fed moss carpets everything, making a softly woven, ro ro woven rug of the backyard disjecta. Nothing could be more ruderal, this knitting together of liquid, rubble and sun. Someday all the ground round here will be blanketed in seamless green. Absorbing up to 20 times their weight in water, they form a sort of creeping floor cloud. Once something has been said to creep, it's hard not to think of it as sneaky, furtive, savalesque. But this organism's creeping is entirely wholesome. Its sporophytes probe nothing but the light and air where their load will burden no one else. It's hard to peel sinister connotations off a damp, soft, creeping mass. Let your nose lead the way. Curl a corner loose on the paving stones and breathe in that scent of earth and long trapped rain that no one's felt the need to think up a $10 word for. There's something tacit, tenacious to learn from their fragile, soft walled nature. Suburban sheep with biblical names Baal and some such, cluster just under the motorway flyover. Groping in an uncreepy way is a tactile, tacit procedure for finding out. Tatane en français, which gave its name to some sort of gesture of the market stabilizing invisible hand. A tiny grey humpbacked cloud bodying into an expanse of blue framed by an extravaganza of MGM backdrop clouds becomes our milieu for a moment trying to feel its way into the sea of soft white, unwailing itself as it goes until there's nothing of it left, or everything, just not in a form we can pick out from the mass. We could pick out sheep for counting if we stopped the car under the overpass, but not cloud. It's all the one to us. Swallows lift off, scattering shadow on the grass as they go, but only once the phone has been put down do they zoom into clear view. The stillness needed to capture that motion just is not here, only a chain of pictures of aftermath and residual cloud. That atlas, map of something constantly in movement, reminds us that lines are an invention of ours, cutting the earth in a patchwork that can't be seen from space, no more than we could see a grid over, over, overlaying the face of the sky from here. No borders, no owning, no zones in the ozone. A map in constant motion a raft woven of the molecules of the substance it's transporting. Clouds weave themselves from water. What does a self even mean in this milieu where water molecules are added and dropped, masses mush into each other and lose their outlines? Paraidolic menageries eat each other up and move on across the face of the sun. Our small grey whale slips away from us, melts back into the milieu that she is and that is her. Certain glisse, some slip slide across the surface of the world without impediment, not a bother to them, not a single border to block their skimming, not a mass to melt back into either though. The world's chosen ones, skimmed stone citizens, preserve their unitary oneness in their particular paradoxical substance, liquid when in motion, solid mineral at rest. Milieu's flattened forehead bobs clear of a stack of cumulus for a second or two. She might be trying to tell us something about this cycle of effacing and emerging. Clouds and birds in motion can't be captured, nor moss whose creeping is more glacial than we can even see. And a Twitter weatherman tells us the average life expectancy for a cloud is 10 minutes. The watercourses from which we abstract have been contaminated, reads a sponsored ad from Irish Water. If they're out here abstracting water badly, 
What is it that the clouds do in their non-stop work of distillation? Water courses through us too, of course, making of us and our external plumbing a sort of alembic of living and unliving parts for unfiltration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, quite stunning. Uh, next, next we hear from Matthew Hay, who is the author of Death Magazine, longlisted for the Polaris First Book Award, and Vampires, shortlisted for the Michael Marks Award. Uh, Matthew has been published in the Ford Book of Poetry, the Poetry Review, and in anthologies from Pam Macmillan and Vintage. Welcome, uh, Matthew. Thank you uh, very much, um, uh, and thank you, Vic, for inviting me. I'm I'm really really happy to be here, and um, uh, it's been great listening to everyone's work. It's been so. <clears throat> strange and diverse and beautiful and uh yeah just just fantastic to listen to um i'm going to uh read from my debut collection um death magazine uh, which was published a few years ago now um <clears throat> and the best way to um i guess explain the concept of, of the collection um is that it's kind of a surreal absurd, um, cut, largely cut up uh, collection of poems, which um, uh, kind of riffs on the wellness industry and fitness industry and um, kind of, you know, like blogs, sort of like Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop blog in particular. Um, and basically these worlds um, uh, and these out, out uh, avenues that try to um, push the idea of the perfect life and the perfect body and things that don't really exist. Um, so I'm going to start with the title poem from the book, uh, which is laid out kind of like the contents page of this imaginary, absurd, slightly futuristic uh, magazine. <clears throat> Death Magazine. Six essential tips for transferring your consciousness to the cloud. Say goodbye to skincare. A look at the products you won't be using when you have no skin. What do cloud bodies eat? Dealing with the emptiness that replaces hunger. Pink is the new glass. Glass is the new black. Twiddling your ghost thumbs. How to occupy your mind in lieu of earthly activities. New wave worries. What to think about once money, health and beauty have slipped away with your body. Coexisting cougars. Inside the world of yummy mummy duplicates. Deleting the other you. A step-by-step -step guide. How to leave a gym fit corpse. Scare stories. What if your keeper pulls the plug? I was a human fish tank, one reader's story. The eternity itch, preparing for a life without orgasm. I have no mouth and I must cream, in memory of moisturizer. I can't exist like this, what to do when? Uh, the next poem I'm going to read is called do you even lift bro do you even lift bro no i slugged out beneath the bar virgin under stainless steel we have one final form and its mouth coughs dirt clods backwards Lads roll the glue of themselves between their index fingers, like Bishop when he nicked his thumb. All I see as I heft the weight is alien resurrection, Ripley writhing in the muck of alien intaglio. Nothing I want to be could be achieved through protein. My body ideal is a bone-white woman, louche 
among the brood. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read is sort of styled like a, an interview. Um, it's basically taken from an interview I was reading in a um, magazine with Joe Wicks. I don't know if you have Joe Wicks over there, but in, in Britain, he's a, he's a sort of annoying fitness instructor who's on the telly and um, just, just tries to make everybody feel bad about their body, basically. So um, I sort of read this interview and then collaged this, uh, this sort of fake interview poem out of it. Um, so this is called Interview with a New Father. <clears throat> How are you finding the new arrival? Even in the absence of light, life has found this little human being. People tell you that you'll fall in love instantly, but you never understand just how much you're going to love a 15 minute workout. Did you cry when she was born? You never understand just how much you're going to lie on the sofa and eat some chocolate. I made myself go upstairs in the absence of light to my home gym and smash the ocean floor. How do you fit in exercise now that you're a dad? I wanted to lie, but better to dive down to the ocean's love. Half the world is in gloomy depths. Even in the absence of a sofa, it made me feel so much love to go to my home gym and smash time. I just burst into tears. Will you relax your schedule now that you're a dad? You love this little human being instantly, but you never eat the sofa. In the absence of light, life has found a time. Half the world is people telling you that you'll fall to the ocean floor. Do you find it hard to switch off? I just wanted to lie in the depths and eat gloomy chocolate. You can find this little human being skimming time. I made myself go upstairs to my home gym and smash an isopod. Until you're giant, you'll never understand just how much absence of workout is. What does fatherhood mean to you? I wanted to work out. It made me go upstairs to my ocean floor, lie on the sofa and understand. Life has burst into tears. The world is in me. You feel so much, you fall in light. You never understand just how much you're going to love this giant deep sea isopod. Uh, I think the next few poems I'm going to read are kind of continuing the sort of um, uh, absurd masculine aesthetic um, and they come from the section of the book which is, is based, it's called Fitness and it's um, kind of a series of um, mini autobiographies of male celebrities um, which focuses largely on um, their sort of fitness routines again something i read in um in a, in a blog and wanted to uh, make a, a poetic version of um so each one is named after the the male celebrity so i'm just going to dive into it and read a few of those <clears throat> marlon brando taking on the role of a real man brando played the part humiliated he was cruel but charismatic. Women threw their hotel room keys at the perfect American father. Essentially, sport is sexuality. In locker rooms, the male is a tool to entice and intimidate. Before the lean, strong body, there was the earthquake of a feminine. Tom Hardy. For someone neither big nor hard, Hardy is so hardy and hard to kill. He does a convincing impression of bacteria. Having shed 15% of his organs, 
is in a lower weight category. In order to encourage the body to adapt, his trainer employed a technique called 20 kilograms of refrigerated brains. Hardy can live weeks without his head. Um, this poem is called Jake Gillinghall. Those shots of Gillinghall building the internet, snaked with collective wounds, hit men like a shitload of gender baggage. Having achieved snarling veins, we ask why? We believe a sledgehammer is for everybody, but as men, we use it to breathe. Gillinghall had six months to resemble a suit of armor. He did this by performing 2,000 cultural expectations a day. When he mistakenly ran eight miles, he not only flipped, he beat Eminem face down to a soundtrack of compassion. Um, I'm going to move on to another section of the book. Um, which is more, uh, I guess, directly influenced by the aforementioned Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop blog, um, which is kind of crazy to begin with before you even start making it absurd. So it's hard to make the absurd absurd, but I've tried. Um, so uh, these are kind of little wellness uh, blog type poems. Um, and the first one is called My Rubbery Journey. <clears throat> but either way, no matter where I am, when I'm up, I'm a great soft jelly thing. I can't wait to shamble about, light beamed from within. The first thing I do when I wake up is hate. Let me tell you, I go down to the kitchen and pour myself a great big glass of hate. I like knowing where my eyes used to be. I'm on a rubbery journey right now, doing something legless from the start of my day. I stay in my robe to let blotches of diseased evil gray sink in. I leave a moist trail when I have three different morning drink derivatives. Like everything I like, I love humps of matter, curly hair, pulsing fog. It's pretty much my ethos in life. I'm the quintessential thing that could never have been known as human. Uh, I'll just do the last few now because I'm coming to the end of the time, I think. Um, this is called Reptile, Your Relationship. One, you may have been grotesque for some time, Two, you may be a glacial crevasse, binge watching the gloom. Three, you may have found the perfect crocodile, but find yourself beyond description. Four, it's impossible to enjoy dinner with the monstrous bird. Five, perhaps you felt swollen, but get so massive, a head as large as the child, that you wonder why. Six, you may be mimicking feelings that were established when you were ridges of tufted flesh. Seven, many of the fears and beliefs you emulate are the wings of adulthood. Eight, trust your primary partner. Nine, if any of these scenarios applies to you, shrug. And I'm just gonna do one more short one. Um, this is called um, Hysterical Summer. <clears throat> Floral prints will carry you like burnt out circuits. Whatever is on the agenda, printed mules and crying just go together. None of us wants to be a machine trying to escape. We would not tolerate a straw circle bag or bubble jewelry. 
hysterical hibiscus is self-explanatory. Even though yellow is going to happen, corroded metal is unapologetically feminine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Well, Vic, what, what can I say? You gave us uh, an incredible grouping of folks here tonight. Um, it's been fantastic. And I'd like to thank you all, especially Vic, but also, of course, Sasha, Nikki, Ellen, and, and Matthew. Um, and uh, just quickly, um, we will be appearing again in two weeks. Um, at that time, we will have a show with Leanne Brown, John Thomas Kelly, Wanda Phillips, and Bob Rosenthal. So please join us for that. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to go ask Cassandra how she's doing so early in the morning. I'm fine. I'm fine. I will catch up on people I missed on the recording. I just could not do the hour earlier on, on a Sunday. Uh, but what I came in on, which was Nikki um, onwards, was absolutely magnificent. I love it when poetry is read. That makes me want to write more poetry. How how fabulous. Fantastic. Um, so, Jeff, are you going to do the open mic or how, how are we doing this? I think I've got a list if you want me to do yeah. it. Cassandra, sure, I'd love you to do it. But you know what? I'd really love to introduce you properly and have you read a poem. Do you have one handy? Okay. Sure, I can, I can read a poem and um, and then we've got uh, a little open to okay, end. Okay, excellent. Great. Uh, Cassandra Atherton, we're so glad you're here. You're an award-winning prose poet and international expert on prose poetry. Your prose poetry is widely anthologized and has been translated into Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. You've been publishing, you've had published more than 30 books, and you're currently writing an illustrated book of prose poetry on the Hiroshima maidens with funding from the Australia Council and the Victorian government. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry and Introduction and co-edited the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She's commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia, and we're so glad you're here. Sandra. Thank you so much. I'm look, I was so inspired by William Carlos Williams references in um Nikki's poetry that I thought I'll uh, I'll rip out one that has um some William Carlos Williams in it. It's called mm. Plum. William Carlos Williams was a genius and he has my lover's initials or rather my lover has his initials. I often eat the plums that were in the fridge, but I don't expect to be forgiven. Not everything depends upon that or the wheelbarrow of promises that still lies at the bottom of his heart. That's just a vain hope. My lover likes plums, the ones with the tough skins and the scarlet flesh, not the yellow. We like the same food except for chops. I won't eat lambs to the slaughter. Once I was called a goo-goo-eyed vegetarian, which basically means I won't, anything, I won't eat anything cute with big imploring eyes because it would almost be like eating myself. Baby cows are cute, pigs are cute, and lambs are definitely cute, even mutton dressed as lamb, so they're all out. But I eat chicken and fish and sometimes beef if it isn't veal. He lived on a farm once, so he hates sheep. He tells me that sheep are the stupidest animals ever. They deserve to be eaten. He even tells me the story about how sheep follow each other in straight lines and that the earth becomes shiny and solid beneath their feet. And he and his brothers would ride along their little tracks on their bikes, red bikes, like that wheelbarrow in his faulty heart. One day he might even grow me some plums so that I can pick them and put them in our fridge. I want a red Smeg 473 litre fridge. I want my whole kitchen to be red. He draws the line at a red fridge. He's never heard of Smeg, Smeagol, Smog the Dragon. He doesn't believe in the nuance of sound. He doesn't understand the importance of a big, red, expensive fridge. He thinks they are just for keeping things cold like plums. I would like to introduce our co-host and uh, technical extraordinaire, um, John Wessick. I'm assuming he hasn't been read out at the beginning, so I will do it now. John Wessick is a regional editor of the San Diego Poetry Annual. He's published hundreds of poems and stories in journals such as the Atlanta Review, Berkeley Fiction Review, I-70 Review, Lowe's, Lowe's, I'll get him to do that one, Lowe's Toft Chronicle, I'll go with that, New Verse News, I'll blame it on my Australian accent, Patterson Literary Review, Pearl's 
Perini's Fountain, Slipstream, Space and Time, and Underside Stories. His most recent books are The Shaman in the Library and The Prague Deception. John, what do you got? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have searched the globe for the perfect sponsor for Lit Bomb. It's apocalyptic. Brighten up that dank bomb shelter with bold colors like cobalt blue and uranium yellow. Apocalyptic's all-natural cadmium formula protects your lips from damaging neutrons while soothing and moisturizing radiation burns. Whether you're running from flesh-eating zombies or battling killer ants the size of a locomotive, Apocalyptic will last 24 hours with no smudging, retouching, or transfers. That's Apocalyptic, making preppers beautiful since 666. Back to you, Cassandra. Ah, oh, that was so good. Oh, my goodness. I think we're going to have to have so many lip balm jokes after this. We're going to have to put them on posters and, uh, and yeah, add to our repertoire. Um. Now, I am not sure whether Ron is going to read for us or Michael Keith, who was here, who I asked. Ron, are you up for it or not? Uh, not quite. Uh, I'll do it next time. But, uh, yeah, I'll do it next time. No probs, no probs at all. I probably wanted to uh, to also say um, to plug Vic, and she doesn't know I'm going to do this, but I bought her brilliant Disrupted Blue Book, which is quite extraordinary and nothing like I've ever read before and is brilliant. Um, and I think she's amazing. So um, sorry, Vic, to put you on the spot there, but a little plug for that book, which is incredible. So we just have our awesome duo. We have Cindy and Bob who are going to end out the open today. Cindy is no, badass. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry, Cassandra. No, Vicky K wanted to read. Oh, sorry. I didn't have her on my list. Vicky K. Awesome. Yeah. Vicky, I think you have to unmute and I'm excited to hear what you've got for us. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I've got a prose poem uh, and it's written by uh, one of my uh, other selves, one of my alter egos, um, and it's called True True Love. Uh, it's an invitation, my honoured friend. It is enormously delightful to invite you to my upcoming wedding festivities on 24th August. I do hope you will be there with us. Over time you will know I went through numerous erotic experiences, but no one person proved to be fitting wedding fodder. I did consider lots of other options too. E.g. I proposed to my bed, who I did love deeply, but they turned me down. Then I thought of the ghostly spirit who follows me from room to room, but he didn't wish to be tied down. Following much serious reflection, I decided to wed my one true love, myself. We feel utterly thrilled to be expressing our love for ourselves in this mode, so we both desire that you join with us to glorify this union. Obviously, since you know me so inclusively, well, both of us indeed, it will be no surprise to you to see me dispense with custom. I will be the one giving myself to myself. Much expense will be prevented subsequently, which is good indeed. I, together with my future spouse, to implore your presence, Lily. Kiss, kiss, kiss. That was awesome. Absolutely adored it. I love that you have alter ego written poems. That is brilliant. But my favorite line's got to be I'd propose to my bed because I reckon I'm super close to doing that. That was so good. I absolutely loved it. It was really fabulous. Thank you for reading. Thank you so much. And sorry for missing you. Don't worry. Um, so I think unless anyone else wants to quickly stick their hand up and read, we've got our delightful duo. All right. Wow. Badass Brooklyn. I think it's over to you from the living room. Okay, um, I'm going to read one of my um, alliterative poems. I'm working on an alliterative series. This is Jay. And in some ways, it's a very fitting poem. And in other ways, it's kind of poignant. 
because I wrote it before my mother passed away. She passed away last June, so it has a reference to her in it. Her name was Jean, so I used it for the J. It's called The Jester's Jamboree of J. Jottings from my jaw-dropping journal. In January, I jammed with James Brown, Janet Jackson, and Jewel in Japan. Here's a jazzy jug full of jingles. Jojo was a man who thought he was a loner. Hey, Jude. Those are, uh, in case you don't know, British, you know, songs. Yeah. Hey, Jude. I'm a joker, I'm a smoker, I'm a midnight joy to the world, jumping Jack Flash. In the jungle, the mighty jungle, you picked a fine time to leave me, Jolene. I enjoyed Erica Jong and her juicy joyride in a jet, but I reject James Joyce's jumbled jabber. I'm a Jew, so maybe I'll just join Jesus for a Jacob, Joshua, Jeremiah, Jonah journey to Jerusalem in July. My jolly, jovial, jocular, and jaunty mom, Jean, me, Jenny, from Jersey, my joy, my jubilance, my Jedi, still is. Keepers, the judge has just adjudicated the jury's judgment. Donald J. Trump, that jaundiced, jeering, and jaded jingoist, is jaywalking dejectedly to jail. Justice in June. And I wrote it not knowing when the verdict would come down, so it was kind of prescient. Justice in June. Jim Dandy and jollification. No joshing. No joking. I'm so juiced. Let's rejoice. Yah, yah, yah. Well, the yah, yah, yah has a J in it, so I guess it's ja, ja, ja. <laughs> that was awesome. So prophetic. My goodness. I'm, I, you might well, have to write more prophetic poems about Donald Trump, but it was a beautiful way to remember your mom's sin, and I know how special um, she is to you, and um, what a beautiful way of putting her in a poem. Loved it. So now we have Bob, who is known affectionately as the Kitchen Laureate. Uh, he has an in, he fits beautifully into this show because he always gives us something to think about, which is just it's just slightly left of center quite often. Sometimes it's information, sometimes it's not. Sometimes he sings. You actually never know what he's going to do. Occasionally, he'll show us his t-shirt. Bob, over to you for for this last moment of the open. Okay, good. Thank you argues, argues about the right way to divide up the money, argues about the right way to portray the horizon, argues about the color his hands should be, argues about the webs that encase his head, argues about the difference between the horse and the camel, argues about the right way to remove spanking from the story, argues about the distance to the frozen lake. And that's our Bob. We wouldn't have him any other way. Absolutely love that, Bob. Awesome. I'm not sure Thank how you, you remove spanking from a story. I'll let you know if I come up with the answer today. I, I want to know more about that, that spanking. That's it. Because <laughs> he's coming over to my house on, on Monday and I have to be repeated. Well, let me know if there's any spanking involved on email. I'm spanking around in my living room. <laughs> Love it. One day you two have got to like do a lip balm together, either in the kitchen or the living room. We're not fussy. <laughs> Mark, back to you. And thanks, Jeff, for letting me do the open. I do love a bit of my my friends on the open. Well, once again, thanks so much to Vic uh, for helping organize this and Sasha. Nikki, Ellen, and, Matt, and Matthew. Um, I'm going to close out here with a, a little poem called The Dark Bird Speaks Cold Truths. She cries out in the dark, 
Where are you? Are you somewhere? Where you are? Or are you where? Where you are? That's it for tonight. Thanks, thanks, folks. Uh, lots of love, lots of poetry, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you in two weeks. And thanks so much for being here tonight. Love you all. See ya. Lip bomb. <laughs>